Um, I want to start out by, by just saying one of the things I got thinking about as I was going to be doing this introduction is one of the uh, items that we added to our values last year was the word courage. And I, um, we were speaking today with, with Dr. Scott, and I already had this plan, but she, she brought up exactly really the essence of what I wanted to say, which courage is opening a closed door. And I just have to say, I know that um, she has walked through many of the uh, barriers of um, both race and, and, and gender within American medicine, and she's truly one of the pioneers. Um, she's the first African-American trained um, female cardiothoracic surgeon in America, and she's going to share uh, with us really her journey. But I want to start out by just kind of giving you a brief bio. I couldn't possibly go through her entire CV with you all because um, her accomplishments and, and accolades and travels across this country are absolutely um, incredible. And her contributions to academic medicine in particular are really amazing. Uh, but I'll start out by just giving you a brief. She uh, grew up in uh, Newark, New Jersey, and her, her father was a dentist. She had an uncle who was a thoracic surgeon and got to see really what they were doing in the community and how they were uh, contributing to, uh, to um, really all that, all that happens in a community in terms of direct impact. Um, she went on to uh, the Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute there in uh, Troy, New York. Went to medical school at uh, NYU in the city. Spent a little time there. Um, then she did her general surgery uh, in the New York area as well. Went on to Boston University where she was the first uh, African-American female trained in thoracic surgery there. Came back to New York Medical College and did cardiac training. Then she took that, that bright burning star into the Lone Star State <laughs> and um, made it down to uh, Houston where she was at UT Houston. Uh, was the first um, Mary Fraley cardiovascular research fellow. Um, she was also an associate professor there. She made her way out to California and spent some extensive time at UCLA where she really um, went from an assistant professor all the way up to really helping build uh, the general surgery residency program. Did a tremendous amount of uh, research um, as well as obviously operating in that environment. And she became the uh, chief of the division of cardiothoracic and vascular surgery. Hmm. Now, she has since uh, come back and is uh, very active in Dayton, Ohio at um, Wright State University, the Boonshoff School of Medicine, where she is a professor of surgery. She also uh, gets to spend time and is the chief of thoracic surgery at the VA Medical Center, where she's the director of the Sim Lab there. So it is with uh, great um, privilege for me to be inter uh, introducing Dr. Rosalind Scott. Thank you very much for that ex extensive introduction. I'm really honored to, to be here today. I'm actually quite um, thrilled that this exhibit, Opening Doors, has had the life that it has had. Um, it has been around for a while and is actually the most successful exhibit that the National Library of Medicine has ever done. So, uh, so I was actually really quite honored to, uh, to be a part of that. And I'm hoping that you'll enjoy the exhibit and also uh, enjoy a little bit about what I'm going to, uh, to say. Uh, as we said, the courage to open a closed door. I told him that uh, I was gonna have this in my slide and, and, uh, and, and there it is. So, I think it's important to not just talk about what I've done, but more importantly to say a little bit about um, how, how I got there and how any of us get where we are is a, a very important um, reflection, I think, of the past. And, and I think that in talking a little bit about the past, you'll understand um, about how my passions have, uh, have developed. And um, our ancestors have really uh, left us some guideposts. And I think in today's world, we often forget history. Uh, and certainly, we frequently forget, um, forget family history. 
and, and also uh, a little bit about the influence that, um, that Africa has really had in the world that's not noted. And an important influence, I think, that I learned recently is that um, yoga is actually not an Indian art form. It actually originated in Africa, and as Africans traversed north towards the um, Indian continent, they brought to what is now India uh, uh, yoga. And the uh, ancient Africans really understood that there was a mind, body, and spirit connection. And what do we now know in healthcare? There's an important mind, body, uh, spirit uh, connection. So here I am doing what I think is the most influential pose, and it's a war, um, and it is the warrior pose. And you can talk about this pose by saying that you're grounded in the present, aware of the past, and looking to the future. And as a further explanation of this pose, you can say that this helps you develop a sense of determination and per perseverance, which is important if you're going to try to open a closed door. And being a warrior rarely, if ever, means being aggressive. Don't have the chip on your shoulder. Um, but to really pr proclaim your strength by, um, you don't proclaim your strength by trying to show others that they're weaker, but the trust of the warrior is the ability to release the need to control in order to create openness and authenticity. I was interviewed by one of the reporters and I talked about how important it is to be authentic, how important it is not to have a chip on your shoulder. So let's talk a uh, just for a couple of minutes about the past and um, what healthcare was like for, um, for us and you know, for, um, for African Americans. So in, in colonial America, women were not allowed to learn about medicine, right? You were rejected. But interestingly, plantation owners who really had a financial interest, if you will, in keeping um, slaves healthy, had clinics and health care that was provided for them. And that health care was provided by predominantly older slave women who brought from Africa the remedies and treatments and herbs that were used in, uh, in Africa. Many of these women became so knowledgeable about healthcare that the white physicians actually uh, consulted with them. Uh, and then, after, as, as happens in a competitive environment, uh, the Tennessee physician said, we can't have these slave women outdo us in healthcare, so let's pass a law that they can't um, practice medicine. And that restriction for medicine really was further um, made real when the American Medical Association was founded in 1846, and initially, of course, they restricted African American from being members. And it was over 100 years before any African American could join the American Medical Association. And um, at that time, the national organization said that if you were denied membership, you could um, you could appeal you could appeal to them. In 1892, the first African American medical journal had an editorial that was um, written by Dr. Vanderhurst that said, you know, it's really time that we have an organization for African American physicians. They couldn't join, they couldn't join the AMA. So they decided in 1895 at the Atlanta Cotton States International Exposition that they were going to kind of meet together and see what would happen. Interestingly, years, years later, uh, I was one of the founding members of the Society of Black Academic Surgeons that was founded by Claude Organ. We met at a conference and said, about 12 of us said, let's get together and start an organization that can help support uh, African American surgeons. So the model is 100 years old. So these physicians met at the First Congregational Church in, um, in Atlanta. The church still stands there. It's, a, it's actually a historic site now. And um, Dr. Boyd was elected the first president, and Dr. Daniel Hale Williams was the first, uh, first vice president. So what's interesting about that church is that my grandfather was a minister of the church at that time. And uh, he built the church. Uh, it was uh, founded 
1846 by a group of abolitionists, missionaries, and former students of Oberlin College um, that were dedicated to uh, education of recently um, freed slaves. And, and actually, one, one of his daughters actually went to, uh, went to Oberlin. But this particular church had a broad range of social and educational services, including a nursery, recreational programs, home for working girls, a library, uh, classes in domestic sciences, an employment bureau, and it was actually recognized as one of the most progressive centers of uh, Christian social action in the nation at the time. So you heard me talk about Daniel Hal Williams for a moment. So Daniel Hal Williams is important to me for many reasons. Um, one, he was the first individual um, of any um, background who successfully operated on the hard and he's known for having um, really set the stage and establishing the fact that you could, do, you could operate on the heart. Uh, and he, uh, at the uh, behest of a um, minister in his community who was, whose daughter was having trouble getting into nursing school, decided, well, maybe we need to start a nursing school that African-American women can actually <coughs> join in sh Chicago. And so he, he built Provident Hospital uh, in Chicago, and at that time it was really the only school, um, sorry, not school, the only facility in Chicago where African-Americans could, uh, could practice medicine. So the interweaving, so when I was in graduate school, I took this course called General System Theory. I don't really know about General System Theory, but it really talks about how the circles, in a very simple way, there are these circles. You know, you have your circle a little here, that and then as your circles expand, you see the interrelatedness of, of many things. So this is actually a little bit of a study of general systems theory. My, gran my uncle, Dr. Arthur Falls, um, also went to Northwestern like Dr. Um, Hale Williams did. Um, Dr. Hale Williams was the first African-American to go to Northwestern Medical School. And in 1920, my, um, my uncle went to, went to Northwestern. When he was in school, the professors told the classes that if you're not sure what to do, go find yourself a nigger and use him as a guinea pig, quote, unquote. After obtaining his medical license in 1925, he opened an office in um, the south side of Chicago, practiced at Provident Hospital, and ultimately became the president of Provident Hospital. So this is another important yoga pose. Um, Uttakatasana. So yoga poses are studies in, um, in opposing forces. So you always have a center core that's keeping you in place, and then you have a force that's sending you in one direction and a force that's sending you in the opposite direction. And that's where balance comes from, right? Your inner core is keeping you balanced. So this particular pose can be described as um, it's a defiance of spirit. It's showing how high you can reach even when forced down. Your character is unleashed. You won't take anything sitting down. So what's a girl to do with that as a background, right? <laughs> Cigars on New Street. So my father had an office on New Street in Newark, and this is he, um, it was like a typical brownstone, like a Cosby house. And uh, the first floor was, a was an office, well, not an office, it was kind of a storefront. The second floor, there was a uh, podiatrist. His office was on the, you know, the next floor, and then the top floor was where they lived until I went to school and they moved into a more, su you know, suburban area. But, um, but he didn't smoke, but the day I was born, apparently he ran up and down New Street with cigars. <laughs> So we all know about education, right? So reading is fundamental. So here I am reading. <laughs> um, this picture on the bottom is um, a college picture at RPI when I was working on the uh, newspaper. So, and of course, where does you know where do you start? So surgeons, I love this picture. Trying to put the little record on the Victrola. I mean, nobody does that anymore, right? Uh, I made my prom dress. That's me in my prom dress, so <laughs> made my prom dress. So, <laughs> so, 
So when people talk about women, uh, not, you know, should women be surgeons, uh, shouldn't be surgeons, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, you know, we've been using our hands all the time. You guys have to figure it out, but we've been sewing, knitting. <laughs> I mean, we're naturals. We're naturals. So uh, I think that women are called to be healers, and certainly, you know, I have that calling. And then, of course, after reading comes writing. So I was surprised in that over in the library they published some of my stuff, but anyway. <laughs> so. <laughs> so what are some of the things that have sort of evolved in my career? Well, I, you know, I did a lot of surgery, and then I figured out that um, you know, I wanted to be kind of a, a learn how to be a leader. Uh, this is a very prestigious program. You have to be, it's, it's been in existence for a number of years. Um, it, it is out of Drexel University, but it's kind of the calling card for many academic centers to, to um, choose women. They'll say, have you been in ELAM? You have to be nominated by your dean and two senior faculty. Dean has to pay for it, you know, has to give you time. You know, it's, I don't know what it costs now. When I did, it was like $30,000, $40,000 plus your travel to go you know, places, so the dean has to commit to having, um, to supporting you. So she nominated me and I, you know, I, I joined the program a number of, of years ago. Part of the program includes doing an action project that's supposed to take you out of your department, you know, put you some, pl um, I'm sorry, put you someplace in a higher, higher role, higher place in, in your institution. Unfortunately, when I was ready to do my action project, my um, dean was leaving and um, the school had a lot of disorganization at the top and I didn't feel that the spirit of what the action project was supposed to accomplish was going to be accomplished in my local environment. So I called around the town, I say around the town, around the country, to try to say, you know, what else, I need to have a nice action project that can really be effective for me. So, you know, sort of a uh, lesson in mentorship, called for some help, found some mentors, and ended up uh, working with a, um, an organization that was developed out of Johns Hopkins that's small but powerful, because all of the boards of medicine, um, many universities internationally, uh, all the licensing organizations, the Association of American Colleges, the National Board of Medical Examiners, uh, and um, an, a number of industries that are interested in healthcare technology or members, and they create standards for, uh, for healthcare education, and they're now going into quality. I have been around the smartest people that I've ever met in my life by having become involved in this organization. You know, as a, um, you know, even as a, uh, as a lowly first time going there, I was so intimidated by all this technology stuff, and I <coughs> said, how am I ever going to traverse this? Because the person who's executive director is a Hopkins heart surgeon who I already knew. And, you know, he just, when I tell you, threw me in the pond, you know, sink or swim, that's the way I felt, threw me in the pond. But the first year I worked with the organization, I was awarded the Networker of the Year Award, and two years later I was put on the board of directors, and they've extended my, p my position, you know, on the board, and I've been, um, actually shifting a lot of my interest into healthcare technology um, from an educational perspective. I'll show you a couple of things that I've been doing. I have the only mobile simulation center in the VA system. It's a 46-foot trailer that um, goes all over you know, our, our network and has become the envy and model for what the VA wants to do, uh, wants to do nationally. Um, oh, so arithmetic, reading, writing, arithmetic. So arithmetic. Um, Oh, I'm very proud of the fact I got the highest grade in my accounting class <laughs> in grad school. <laughs> so, but it's wonderful because I can tell these administrators, you know, that try to, you know, tell me I don't know how to add, you know, I got the creds, you know. <laughs> I got the creds. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not trying to be a show off. I'm just establishing, establishing the creds, <laughs> right? I got the and, um, you know, as a result of many of the influences around Medviquitous and people that I've met through there, I've been actually very successful in getting, um, you know, quite a bit of, of money and, um, you know, and grants. And really, most importantly, have been able to increase our, 
you know, or learning learning encounters from 300 in our first year, a thousand over a thousand last year, and I think we'll probably be close to 1,200, 1,300 uh, this year. So um, I, I, I made that myself, so I know a little bit about arithmetic. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I'm doing that's very exciting is that the VA is creating a whole virtual reality medical center. And in my role as medical advisor to the uh, chief learning officer of the VA, uh, I've been putting together um, five initial projects around the country to, to you know, show how this can be used. Our focus is to do things that are patient-facing, patient things that are uh, provider-facing in terms of education, and then importantly to have patient-provider interaction. So what, what are the things that we can do in healthcare that we can provide care, you know, real care, um, that doesn't necessarily require touching a patient? So group appointments for, for diabetes, you know, maybe one. Um, we have some technology that's like, you know, um, we, so that people can actually exercise in their own home, but their avatar is um, being recreated to do those same things. So then you can have an instructor, you know, encourage them, correct them, or, you know, wh whatever. So a whole, whole, whole lot of things. I don't have enough time to tell you all of that, but this is extremely exciting. I'm um, presenting this uh, in about a month in Europe at at one of their major medical education meetings. So um, I'm very excited to have been uh, a part of this implementation. So just in conclusion, um, you know, what are the sources of strength and renewal? So that's sort of the origins of grace under fire, right? So I would say you have to culture, cultivate nurturing friendships. You know, this is my ELAM learning community and for many years, um, after I was in Elam, we um, we had monthly calls that we supported each other. So we really were a community that lasted beyond uh, beyond the fellowship. And um, all of these individuals have, you know, national. Um, some of them have N NIH positions. Some are chairs of departments. But they're all very, um, very, very accomplished uh, women. Um, enjoy a balanced life. Um, I had that particular picture you see of me holding golf swing, um, sort of analyzed by a pro at a at a tournament. And interesting, I don't know how he how he divined it, but he said, "You must you must um, you must do a lot of yoga." I said, "How do you tell that?" He said, "Well, I could tell how you how you use your core." Interesting. I thought that was interesting. And of course, that's my my husband. He's kind of cute, and um, <laughs> that's us at the Great Wall. So, <laughs> and of course, revel in your family. You know, this is sort of Christmas dinner a couple of years ago. That's my, one of my, my granddaughter uh, is born Christmas Day. So her birthday, and interestingly, my uncle, Dr. Falls, he was also born on Christmas Day. And so I grew up celebrating uh, every other Christmas. He, he came to Chicago, from Chicago to the East Coast, and then one of my aunts went to Chicago the other, other Christmas, and we would have dessert at Christmas dinner was his birthday cake. And so th that's her dessert at Christmas dinner was her, her birthday cake. And of course, um, seek inner peace because uh, live a just life um, full of grace. And of course, this is a window from my grandfather's church. So guideposts, pioneers, and open doors. The ancestors have left us guideposts. Our forefathers have taught us determination and perseverance. We have defined the human genome and know now that we are more alike than different, don't we? So with defiance of spirit and the trust of the warrior, we can open any door. Namaste. And so, of course, the other contemporary pioneers and I have hung out on occasion. So I'm delighted to have shared a few thoughts with you, and um, of course, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Mm -hmm. You are. Do I have it on? Yeah, that's on. Okay. 
Thank you, Dr. Scott. That was um, truly amazing, and you are amazing. When I think about what you said about courage and opening doors, about authenticity, um, about uh, being true to yourself mm -hmm. and finding a balance in your life, it really resonates with a lot of what we believe here at Novant Health. We, think, we talk about authentic, personalized relationships, um, and that is so important. The other thing I was reading a lot about you, and like Sid, um, I could not talk about everything that you do, mm -hmm. but I read on the, um, when I Googled you, I found some things that I thought were also very important. <laughs> I Googled you. <laughs> One was that um, you are um, so dedicated to um, inspiring women, um, minorities and women and surgeons um, to be the best that they can be that you are doing research um, to make sure that we're looking at all the populations, the majority populations and the minority populations to deliver the health care that they need. So I want to say thank you for being a pioneer and thank you for coming here today. Let's yeah. give Dr. Scott another hand. Thank you. The, the opening door um, exhibit that Dr. Scott talked about is across the hall in the library and we will um, we hope that you'll be able to join us with that. We are going to take a few questions, but we hope that you'll be able to join us um, in looking at the exhibit. Dr. Scott is actually featured. There are um, five other surgeons who are featured on the exhibit, and it is um, pretty phenomenal. So I'm going to open the um, floor up for questions for Dr. Scott. Oh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Scott. I want to say that again. We're grateful to have you here. Uh, was it Dr. Watkins that threw you in the uh, pool and had you to swim at Johns Hopkins, Hopkins or was no, it someone else? No, it wasn't. It, uh, it, no, it was not um, Levi. It was uh, Peter Green. So um, Peter Green is, uh, you know, is a surgeon that uh, got interested in technology, and he really established the first Internet site that became a collaborative place for all societies related to thoracic surgery around the world. And so he had developed uh, that site, and at that time I was president of Women in Thoracic Surgery, and so I you know, got to meet him then and you know, got to know him, and then he went on to actually develop Medbiquitous. Uh, Medbiquitous came out of a project by the Dean of Hopkins at the time to determine what is the thing that we can do going forward that could influence healthcare education the most. I mean, you know, so he had a focus groups and he had some process by which, you know, that um, was discussed. And at the end of the day, what was felt to be the thing that would make the most difference is having uh, internet standards for uh, healthcare you know, education and, you know, and quality. Uh, because one school would develop something by some home, homegrown, you know, computer geeks would develop something, and then another school had some other homegrown computer geeks developing something, and there was, they couldn't share it because they were, the standards, the um, programming standards were, were different. So uh, now there are a number of ANSI accredited standards that Medbiquitous has developed that will allow organizations, schools, institutions, companies to, to share things. So for example, Medbiquitous standard is now required for, uh, for reporting all of your curriculum to the, double to the American Association of Medical Colleges. So every school in the country uses our standard to, uh, to report their curriculum and you know, you know, it goes on and on. But it was not Levi and it was, um, and you know, unfortunately Levi, yeah. Levi recently died. Yeah, his brother James, his younger brother James, um, practices in Charlotte. He was yeah. a surgeon here, and now yeah. is doing um, wound care. Yeah. Second question, and I'm going to leave this mic. What was it like to have Dr. Proctor as your grandfather? I mean, I um, as a as a seminarian student, I'm mm -hmm. an MD and seminarian student as well. Just to hear Dr. Proctor's name was just gave me goosebumps when you said that. Yes. So what was it like to have that gentleman as your grandfather? So unfortunately, he died before I was born. Mm. So he um, is very much a part of my life, but by knowing the history, and I have some 
things that he personally wrote. Of course, my family has told me all about him. I've, of course, you know, been to the church and in, in several hard times, I've actually sat in that church, you know, and said, am I gonna be able to do this? You know, so, uh, so he was a spirit for me throughout my life, but I never personally knew him. I had some recordings of him speaking, so I've heard his voice, uh, but I know much about him, but mm. never personally, yeah. Yeah. never personally met him. Thank you. I could hog this mic, but I'm going to take it over to Mary Jo. <laughs> um, I have a comment and a question, but my comment is you explained some family history for me because my grandfather was a doctor in a real impoverished area in eastern North Carolina, and he had an African-American midwife on his staff and took her with him on all his calls. and. She was just invaluable and saved lots of babies because she knew some different traditions other than, you know, what he had learned at NYU Medical School, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but the question is, Novon is looking at how we can be a more welcoming place for LGBTQ patients and their mm -hmm. families and support our employees. And are there lessons learned from you know, African-American experience and women's experience that could help us with that initiative? So I'm sure that, you know, whenever somebody that is different goes into an unfamiliar place or a place where people are not used to, it's, there's some similarities. I think what's extremely, um, what is clearly special about the African-American experience is uh, the history of how we got here, and also the fact that we're so visually different. Uh, you don't know that they're different initially, necessarily. I mean, sometimes you may, you know, there may be some mannerisms or whatever, but at the end of the day, you don't know f for sure, you know, until you have a conversation with them. So we have actually, uh, in the VA, the uh, issue around uh, military sexual trauma and also LGBT patients or, you know, uh, has been one of their foci for this particular year. And we've actually developed some standardized patient experiences to assist providers with um, exploring, you know, when they're confronted with a patient that they may not have uh, realized is a, uh, uh, is a lesbian. So, uh, so I would say that th those are opportunities that I think that all of our simulation that we are doing is really um, connected to and directed to the workforce. I think we think of simulation as something that people do as an initial training, but I can show you mounds and mounds of data about how we've had impact on uh, how people feel about how they would change their practice based on simulation experiences that have been designed for the workplace. Dr. Scott, you may not know, but you and I are on the same faculty. I'm from Dayton. And I'm uh, just interested, why are, you, um, why are you at the VA? And what got you to the VA? Does the VA bring you to Dayton? And, uh, uh, right by State. the way, your university is heavily influenced by women leaders with uh, the new dean and with... Uh, yeah, so um, actually, it's the boys. <laughs> um, the, I was recruited by the previous chair of surgery, who's a folks. thoracic surgeon, so, um, but to be at the to be predominantly at the VA. And so interestingly, when I was recruited by Wright State, they had offered me a position and I was looking at a different, you know, another job as well. And I said, I'd like to meet individuals uh, in, in the university who aren't in the College of Medicine who have an interest in healthcare. A and I thought that that, again, this sort of general systems theory view of expanding your circles, I thought that I might be able to find some niche interest or some, you know, just some way that was different from how other people were doing things. Amongst the individuals that they introduced me to was a human factors engineer, Dr. Jenny Gallimore, and uh, she actually came from her sabbatical to interview with me. And she said she taught a graduate class for for engineers in in healthcare. And the, but she'd never taken her class to a healthcare environment. So I said, well, how can you teach about I mean, graduate level? Don't you think they should have an experience in healthcare? So after I arrived, you know, we 
designed her class so that their project, instead of being a pencil and paper project, looking up things in a, you know, in the library. I love libraries, but we really gave them. <laughs> I read books, right? <laughs> but I said, let's give them a real life project, you know, at the VA. So I've been working with Jenny since I've been there the last seven, seven years, and then we have exchanged faculty appointments, and so she's an appointment in Department of Surgery. I have an appointment in the College of Engineering and have been on several PhD thesis dissertation committees, and you know, we've done joint projects together it's, you know, that has earned me my appointment. Uh, so it's been a very uh, interesting way to craft your career, so I think so sort of the glass ceiling question that always comes up is uh, sometimes the way um, across the glass ceiling is to find niches in environments where you can do something that other people you know, aren't quite doing. So, but again, it's sort of the, the good old boys. I can, say, you know, I can say a lot about surgeons, but I can tell you that the good old boys have done many nice things for me. I mean, Peter Green sort of put me in the water, but he knew that I could swim. He knew more, he had more faith in me than I had in myself at that moment in time, but I had to um, live up to his expectations, which fortunately, I, you know, I did. And I think in the same way that um, uh, I was also helped by another thoracic surgeon. So the good old boys aren't all that bad. <laughs> Huh? Oh, we have two. We're going to make it two questions. <laughs> um, the issue of diversity or lack thereof impacts in a very direct way the issue of diverse, uh, disparities in healthcare. And as you well know, the Lewis Sullivan report about the concept of missing in action minorities in the healthcare w industry. So, absent of a di diverse workforce, the offshoot is disparities and the absence of health equity. We know that enrollment in medical schools uh, is declining in general, but it's declining drastically mm -hmm. for minorities, although women are, are increasing in medical schools. Over the years, you've been dealing with these issues, mm -hmm. um, and some of us have been you know, on the periphery of these issues as well. My observation is that there hasn't been much change over the past uh, 20 years, when I say much change, there has been change, but there hasn't been significant change that has impacted workforce diversity in the healthcare industry. Um, so that's very um, daunting to realize that over a 20 year span, we're talking about the same issues, we know what the problems are, we know what needs to be done to correct them. But as organizations, uh, healthcare systems, as our professional organizations exist, the, the conversation never seems to get priority attention. What, is, what are your comments about that? Change is, well, w let me step back. Um, I do s some activities throughout the country in different VAs. Every, one VA is just one VA. You know, you'd think there'd be some common culture, but there really isn't. And then, you know, people have confronted me and said, well, you know, nothing's happening here, but a lot of things are happening there. Why is this, why are we getting support here? We're not getting support there. I would say that the way medicine is today, where there are large organizations, you know, you're no longer the cottage industry that, you know, my uncle had, it's large organizations. Unless the organization, I, feel, I, th I think I feel very strongly about this, the organization at the highest levels has to decide that they're going to push the door open. So I'm trying to open a closed door. They need to be on the other side pushing it open. And there's a cost to pushing the door open. I mean, there, there's absolutely a cost, and I understand that there's a cost. But they have to be on the other side and push the door open because it is the just thing to do. It is the just thing to do because healthcare uh, is supposed to be 
if you think of it as not just an industry but a calling, if you think of healthcare as a calling, then that is a calling for all people. It's not the opportunity to um, make money over here. It is a calling. And if you think of it, I mean, I, I have a business degree, so I mean, I, I can do arithmetic, right? <laughs> but all that arithmetic has to have under it the calling. And um, the, the sense of justice for, for health. Um, it's not an issue about whether, whether healthcare is a right or a privilege and all that. It's, a, it's, it's more than that. It is, it is the calling of caring for your fellow man. And so what is the, so one of the exercises we had in graduate school was um, sort of the last year, we were given a, um, a hospital to run. There were three groups, there were several groups were running a hospital in the same community. And this was, a, and so we were given, um, one was a, a carriage trade hospital, one was a public hospital, and one was, you know, kind of a community, you know, community hospital. And, you know, they each had the finance, so the, in a computer, there was all the finances related to these hospitals. We were given these problems. This community needs X. You know, how are these, are these hospitals going to work together? Are you going to work alone? And so we sort of huddle and negotiate. And then the next day, they put our plan into this computer modeling system and, you know, and, and say what happened at the end of the day. Then we also had some problems. We had to go to the, to the board of the commissioners for this town. And uh, the problem was that this carriage trade hospital wanted to close their um, emergency room. And, um, and I was um, on, on this other, another hospital sort of defending the fact that the community needed to say, as a community, that we're going to care for everyone. The person who was defending the carriage trade hospital to close the emergency room was the CFO for the second largest hospital in uh, Vancouver, you know, in Canada. And I, you know, sort of, you know, I gave my pitch, he kind of gave his, his pitch, and the commissioners, who were the, you know, professors, um, actually said that I won the, you know, sort of I won the day. This CFO, <laughs> this is a classroom, this is a school, I mean, you know, this is, you know, no stakes, we're playing, right, sort of simulation, we're playing. He stormed out of the classroom and just like left because he like lost this battle, you know. And I said, I said to myself, what kind of hospital is he running in Canada, where the values are such that, you know, he's so invested in this bottom line, making money, that he's going to storm out of this classroom because, you know, he couldn't. He ultimately could not defend himself, you know. So the argument has to be that the, the leaders have to understand that this is the just, this is the value, this is the value proposition of healthcare, that we need to figure out how we are committed to a healthy community around us. How does, so what does that do for, for them in the long run? So let's, let's put the, do the arithmetic. If you have a community where people are, are not healthy for whatever reason, then they're not able to work. They get fired from a job, uh, say a low paying job. You know, they get fired from a job because they, they can't show up on time, right? Because they're, um, I don't know, they've been drinking too much the night before or they got COPD and they can't breathe so it takes them longer to get dressed. I mean, you know, wh you know whatever the, the reason, you know, they're not contributing to the community's welfare as they might because they're not healthy. S so if you could make them healthy, then they could keep their job or get a job, right? Then they could have insurance, they could come back to your hospital and actually, you know, pay, you know, the going rate to get their chest x-ray or not, if you're in a capitated system, not even use the resources as much. So there are all sorts of ways to look at the health of the community as having the ultimate benefit, you know, for that 
you know, for that hospital. But, but if the leaders don't believe in it, uh, it's a very much of an upward battle that's not going to, that, that's just going to just churn and churn and churn. And that's what's been happening. You know, you've got a lot of grassroots people that want to churn and churn and churn, and you've got, you know, you know, the African American or the minority community or whatever community kind of talk amongst themselves about how bad this is. But the discussion has to be in the boardroom. The boardroom has to take a stand and believe. And, and I think that's where the change, that's the only way the change can happen. And that large organizations have to, uh, have to invest in their communities, whether it's being giving computers in schools. You know, my, my seven-year-old you know, granddaughter carries around her computer now in a little briefcase, you know. She's like, you know. When I was seven, I carried around books, yes, but you know, she's got her little computer. But there are other schools where those, you know, at six and seven, you don't have a computer, right? So what, what's going to be their opportunity going forward. So if we think of health in a much broader, if we think of not illness, but we think of health. So if you think of an organization that wants to be committed to the health of the community, what does that look like? You know, set a different vision in the boardroom for what health is about. And if you set that different vision of health, you know, then how you act as an organization becomes very different. So now you're not focusing on illness, but you're focusing on wellness. And what does wellness look like? You know, wellness may look like having the family learn how to take care of a wound in the hospital. You know, let the, let the family stay there and do some, of the, do some of the care. You know, let the family learn how to take care of their, their loved ones. I've, I was, um, I saw a patient who was, came to me in a wheelchair, and I said, you know, why are you in a wheelchair? Well, I had my knees operated. Okay, why are you in a wheelchair? Well, I had my knees operated. Did you have a problem after your No, I had my knees operated. I said, wait a second, wait a second. You have knee replacement, so you can walk. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, why are you in a wheelchair? I mean, like, you know, I, 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 so, uh, so I put him in rehab, and three days he was walking up five flights of stairs. But, you know, the, the system, the healthcare system, did not take the time to Im talk to him, talk to his family about what, what he should really be doing, what should really happen to him. So he's cost the healthcare system, you know, his wheelchair, his this, his, his that. He's, he can't be as productive because he's dependent on this wheelchair, right? So is that health? That's not health. I mean, you did a great operation. Their anesthesiologist over here made his $650,000, you know, putting the patient to sleep. <laughs> but what have you accomplished? What have you accomplished in terms of the health of your community? And that's the power of medicine moving from a cottage industry to, you know, Novant Health System. But what is the discussion in the boardroom about health? What does that look like? And if you really analyze what that looks like, you can't but come to the notion that it come, it's, it's a question of justice. Thank you. Dr. Scott, thank you very much. Um, we do have the exhibit across the hallway, and I want to say a few things about that before we go. Um, there's been a whole committee working on making this happen across the system and having the exhibit travel. But I do want to thank Mary Wallace Berry, if she's still in here, for her vision. She went to the National Institute of Medicine and saw this exhibit and said, we have to bring it to Novant Health. So I want to thank her for that. And then Kevin Price, um, with his fraternity, helped us with the funding to get it to the Gantt Center. So I want to 
thank both of them for that and the whole team. On behalf of the Novant Health African American Business um, Resource Group and the, Na the Novant Health Library team, I want to say thank you for coming today. Thank you for your commitment to our core value of diversity and inclusion. Um, and thank you for doing a remarkable job of taking care of our patients. And thank you, Dr. Scott, for sharing your time, your knowledge, and your authentic authenticity with us today. Thank, thank you. you very much. Please join us across the hall in the library.